The world's fastest humans are no match for most of the animal world. Elite human runners can briefly get up to speeds of just over 20 miles per hour, but regular recreational athletes can rarely go beyond 15 miles per hour. When it comes to all out sprinting, we're pretty slow, but this shouldn't come as a surprise. The fundamental skill of human gait, whether it be walking or running, involves your legs generating force against the ground. The harder your legs push down, the faster you go. And this is why we, as upright bipeds, are so slow. If power is the rate at which work is done, a dog or a chimpanzee can use four legs to push off the ground to generate more power, whereas we can only use two. Whether we are walking or running, only one leg is on the ground at any given moment to lift and push us forward. This means less power, and less power means less speed. It's not just about how many limbs you have in contact with the ground either. Being upright means we lose the use of our spines as stride-extending springs. Watch a slow-motion video of a horse galloping. When it lands on its back, its long, flexible spine curves like a powerful bow, storing potential energy. Then, as the animal's hind limbs push off, the spine rapidly unbends, releasing kinetic energy to help catapult it into the air and increase its stride length. So we're not good sprinters, but how do we fare over longer distances? Much better. We can actually outrun specialized quadrupeds like horses in the right conditions. Let's explore why. The white bars in the figure on screen compare the speeds up to which humans can run marathon length distances with the trotting speeds of greyhounds, ponies, and full-sized thoroughbred horses. This is a valid comparison because these kinds of quadrupeds can only run long distances at a trot. So while horses, dogs, zebras, and antelopes can gallop faster than any human can sprint, the grey bars, they cannot gallop for more than a few miles before having to slow down to a walk or a trot especially when it's hot. Even non-elite recreational runners can run a marathon well above the speed at which specialized quadrupeds can trot the same distance. I mentioned in the last part how our ancestors evolved specific adaptations to enable them to run far and persistent hunt. Well, the act of habitually running long distances in the first place is very unusual in the animal kingdom. With the exception of social carnivores like wolves and dogs and hyenas, which run up to 10 miles to hunt, few animals willingly run more than 100 yards or so without being forced to. The short sprints made by hunters and prey on the savannah today never last longer than a few minutes. So the ability to run far, albeit slowly, to catch prey is unique to us. Whether we're talking about bipedal humans or quadrupedal horses walking on two or four legs, the dominant function of a leg is to be a pendulum. This is illustrated in the figure on screen. Notice that during forward motion, when your leg isn't on the ground, it swings forward like a pendulum with a center of rotation at the hip. This swing phase of the gait cycle is mainly powered by your hip flexors like iliopsoas, rectus femoris, and sartorius. The pendular action at your hip flips at the end of the swing phase though, when your foot collides with the ground at heel strike. At this instant, the stance phase for this limb starts and becomes an upside down pendulum whose center of rotation is now at the ankle. In essence, your leg becomes a stilt during the stance phase of the gait cycle. As you transition through stance, your glutes, hamstrings and calves alternately contract to propel you forward, pushing off into a new swing phase. The stilt-like behavior of legs is key to understanding how you use energy when you walk. During the first half of the stance phase, muscles vault your body up and over that leg, elevating your center of mass by about five centimeters. That upward lift expends calories, but stores potential energy. Then during the second half of stance, your body converts that potential energy to kinetic energy by falling downward and forward. Eventually, your swing leg collides with the ground, halting your body's fall and starting a new cycle. These two phases, stance and swing, overlap slightly during walking gait. Stance is defined as the period from initial contact of the foot to 
toe off and is made up of the loading response, mid stance and terminal stance subphases. Swing is defined as the period from toe off of the foot to initial contact and is made up of the initial swing, mid swing and terminal swing subphases. 60% of time in a single walking gait cycle is spent in stance and 40% is spent in swing. A single gait cycle is defined as the period from initial contact of one foot during stance to the following initial contact of the same foot. The distance traveled in a single gait cycle is known as a stride, while your step length is the distance from initial contact of one foot to the next initial contact of the opposite foot. Gait velocity is stride length divided by stride time, while cadence is the number of steps per unit of time. All of these things, cadence, stride length, step length, step time, stride time, stance, swing, are known as temporospatial gait parameters. They allow us to formally define or characterize gait. These characteristics can then be monitored with pressure mats, force platforms, and 3D motion analysis camera systems. The study of kinematics involves the use of 3D motion analysis systems that digitally reconstruct the individual's body as a multi-segment system. Kinematics isn't concerned with the forces, either internal or external, that cause the movement, but rather with the details of the movement itself. Construction of the coordinates and orientation of the rigid body segments allow calculation of joint angles of the proximal and distal segment joint angular velocity, and joint acceleration. Essentially, this means we can evaluate the specific joint motions involved in the phases and subphases of the gait cycle, with a view to gaining an understanding about how the body achieves the efficiencies of motion I alluded to earlier. It's through studies of human gait with kinematic analyses that we know about the trajectory of that center of mass. If you were to view the path of your center of mass during gait, it would take the shape of a slightly undulating sinusoidal wave. The smoother this wave, the more efficient your gait. And we know, based on the last lecture, why efficiency is such an important driver for natural selection. It frees up energy to grow and reproduce. So the movements of your legs, arms and trunk all function to keep this wave as smooth as possible. During the early part of stance, both your hip and knee flexes as a response to loathing to absorb and store the kinetic energy of your falling center of mass. There are also subtler movements, pronation at the subtalar joints, below your ankle, a little bit of valgus collapse at your knee, a deduction and rotation at your hip, which keeps that trajectory nice and smooth. As you come to the latter part of stance, your glutes and hamstrings extend your thigh and knee while your calves contract to plantar flex your ankle, all of which propel your body forward. The subtle movements here function to make your extending limb as rigid as possible so that the force created by your glutes, hamstrings and calves doesn't go to waste. You supinate your subtalar joint, your knee goes from floppy valgus to firm varus, your hip abducts slightly, all to keep that limb as rigid as possible so that it can transfer the force generated by your muscles to the ground. But once we reach walking gait speeds of around 2.3 to 2.5 meters per second, an important transformation occurs. It becomes more efficient to adopt a new motor pattern, running gait. This speed threshold corresponds to the intersection of the cost of transport curves for walking and running in humans. Basically, and in line with what I've been saying about considering gait through a lens of efficiency, we start running when it becomes more efficient to do so than walking. At these higher speeds, running becomes less costly than walking because it exploits a mass spring mechanism that exchanges kinetic and potential energy very differently. When you start to run, your leg takes on a different role than it does when walking functioning like a spring, stretching and recoiling. This spring stretches as the centre of mass falls in the first half of stance and recoils to help the body push up in the second half of stance and then into a jump. Unlike in walking, the body's kinetic energy and its potential energy are in phase rather than out of phase. This reversal again allows us to save energy for what is essentially a different movement task, locomotion at faster speeds. We discussed in the last lecture some of the adaptations that allow us to do this. 
One example is our collagen-rich tendons in the leg, such as the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia. The Achilles in particular is much larger in humans compared with apes and chimps. It allows us to store elastic strain energy during the initial breaking part of the support phase and then to release the energy through recoil during the subsequent propulsive phase. So to summarize, when you're walking, the key energetic principle that moves you forward involves using your legs like pendulums to exchange potential and kinetic energy. When walking, at least one leg is on the ground at all times. It functions like an upside down pendulum as your body vaults up and over with each step. But the instant you switch to a run, your legs start to function like pogo sticks. Instead of your body's center of mass rising at the start of each step, it falls as you bend your knees, hips and ankles. Flexing these joints stretches tendons, especially the Achilles, in your legs, causing them to store up elastic energy, like springs. Then, during the second half of stance, the same tendons recoil while your muscles also contract, straightening your joints and pushing you up and into the air. And all the while, you lean forward at your torso, bend your elbows, flex your knees more as you swing them, and move your arms asynchronously with your legs. So our bodies have evolved to run, but what makes a good runner? In the next part, we'll be discussing the physiology of long-distance running.